invite you again to turn to Colossians chapter 2. As I mentioned earlier, our, our studies are this week taking us into our identity in Christ. And our identity is an interesting thing. Some people, you don't have to question what they look to for their identity. Their car is covered with it. You know what I mean? They've got bumper stickers that, that support the car they believe in or the team that they believe in or the seed corn that they believe in and, and whatever it is. I mean, we as people look to various things for our identity. And... Honestly, in all of those things, they will eventually disappoint us. I mean, you, you see this over and over again. Um, you sometimes wonder why athletes, professional athletes, retire and then they come back or attempt to come back. Well... They're really struggling. Their whole identity was the sport they're playing and what they were in and what they were doing. And they got out and found out, wait a minute, who am I? There are, there are individuals that their whole identity is in their work. And it may be a very worthy work. But there's coming a day when they won't be doing that work. Either they'll get let go, they'll retire, or they are not capable of doing the work. And then it's a matter of questioning our identity. You probably know some people that have struggled with retirement. Thankfully, not all people do struggle with it, but some really do because that was their identity. What do I do with my life? My identity was I get up, I do this, I do this, I do this, and come home, and after 50 years, they give you a nice watch, a pat on the back, and kick you out the door. And you think that they won't know what to do without me. You know what? Everything goes on without us. And Christ came not just to give us another identity. See, we can have a, a number of identities. We can identify with our work. We can identify with our hobby. We can identify with, with what toys we like or what vehicles we drive or anything like that. And Christ didn't come just to add on to that. Christ came to give us a brand new identity and a permanent identity. And that's, that's the major difference that we have in Jesus Christ. That he came to give us a completely different identity and an identity that will not fade away, that is permanent, that you won't have to wake up and, and see that, oh, wow, this really changed. There are people that put their identities in other individuals and then the other individual disappoints them. There are individuals that put their identity in their children and their children disappoint them. No matter what you put your identity in, if it's not in Jesus Christ, it will disappoint. And yet, as Christians, we know that, and yet we often do not walk in the reality of what we are in Christ. And, and just, just to begin this morning, I just want to list 
and, and the list could be lengthy. But I want to list 13 things of who I am in Christ. And I'm, I'm just going to rapidly go through these. And, and then we'll come back and, and make some application. And um, I know the projector thing isn't working today. Um, but if you are not able to keep up on these with notes and you want them, see me afterwards and, and I can get them to you. But Paul was writing here in Colossians, and, and in essence he's saying, I do not want you deceived in being moved away from Christ through some vain philosophy. We are, he says, we are complete in Christ. This is our new identity. You don't need Christ plus something else. It is Christ alone. And he builds on the fact throughout Scripture what we have in Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we learn that we are a new creation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. So, in Christ... You're not the same old person. You, you added a, a new element, a new being. You added the supernatural. We didn't add it. God added it. God put it in our lives. And he gave us spiritual life. And we're not the same. I, I visited with someone recently that, that I, I believe is recently come to know Christ as Savior, and, and in talking with them, they, they used a swear word, and, and they didn't even get the word completely out of their mouth, and they go, oh man, I've been working so hard to not say these bad words, and, and that's the first time I have, and I am so sorry, I, and you could see they were grieved, I've, I've had People say it because they know I'm a preacher. And, but I could see there was, he was broken about it. Why? He's a new creature. There's a new element in his life. It's the Holy Spirit telling him. And the Holy Spirit was right there. And, and it was evidence of that. See, once a person comes to Christ, the Spirit of God dwells within us and he is at work in our lives to mold us and shape us to God's image. We can't be the same. We, we say that the most miserable people on the face of the earth are unsaved. I don't believe that. I believe the most miserable people on the face of the earth are people that are believers but are not walking with God and the Spirit of God is there and they can quench the Spirit and grieve the Spirit but there is this conflict that's going on in their lives. So, I said I'd hurry through these. <laughs> We're a new creation. Number two, we are reconciled to God. And in that same passage, 2 Corinthians Turn there, if you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we're a new creation, and he says, verse 18, now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So here is a holy God, here we are vile, selfish, proud sinners, and through Jesus Christ, our, not, our new identity is we are not separated from God. We are reconciled to God. We, we have made, God has made things right between us and him through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we are now a child of God. That's another aspect. I, I am now a child of God, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. 
I am in God's family. You know, we can, we can get pretty puffed up about our family names. You know what I'm saying? But your family name, I hate to break it to you, doesn't amount to much. I mean, one or two generations away, they may not even know your name. It may not even exist. I mean, you think about it, unless you have sons and they marry and produce sons, your family name could die just like that. But in God's family, I'm a member of God's family. I'm a child of God. And I am a partaker of the divine nature. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. It's not just me now. He has given me the supernatural. He has given me the divine nature. And I am forgiven. You think of that. Forgiven. The, the slate is clean. My sin will not be brought up to me. It is forgiven by faith in Jesus Christ. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. Well, back up. Verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But notice verse 11. And such were some of you. But you are washed. You are sanctified and you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He says, we are washed. Such were some of you. I'm going to illustrate today. This from, from here over to here is our past, okay? Okay. This, this is going to represent in the middle our present. And from here, just need to make sure the arrow was pointing the right direction, is our future, okay? He says, let's go back into your past. He said, you were fornicators and idolaters. We, this is what we were. And he says, but in Christ you have been washed. And in the presence, in the present, he is sanctifying us, meaning he is at work in my life right now, making me more like Christ. And he's already declared me for all eternity justified. God sees me just as if I've never sinned. Although right now I am in the battle, the flesh and the spirit are there. I am battling this, but I don't need to have my past haunting me. He has washed it. He has forgiven it. And that's who I am only in Christ. Not because I go to Grace Baptist Church, not because of anything else. It is only in Christ. And I now have the righteousness of God. He made him, 2 Corinthians 5, to be to us and imputed, put on our account, the righteousness of God. So that my account is forgiven because of the righteousness of God. And I am at peace with God. There's not enmity between God and me. I am at peace with God. I am no longer a slave to sin. In the past, I was a slave to sin. There was only one master I had, and it was sin. It manifested itself in different ways, but I had no choice but to sin. 
That's all that ruled my life was sin. But in Christ, I have been set free from the bondage of sin. And now I have the old nature and the Spirit of God dwelling in. And I now have a choice whether to sin or to obey God. I am no longer bound by sin. I do not have to sin as I walk in the Spirit of God. But that battle is always there. Uh, but I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am now in Christ. You think of this. In Christ, I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. We, we often use this in somewhat of a, a negative sense. Don't do this to your body because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's true. But in this sense... To think that the Spirit of God dwells within me? I mean, that is, that is remarkable. And, and to know that, that He is dwelling within me and the encouragement and, and all that, that comes with the Spirit. So, I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he says, he has made us more than conquerors. More than conquerors. Romans 8, 37. Through Christ. In Christ, it, the word he uses, I love the word, it's hyper Nike Nike is from meaning victory. It means an overwhelming victory. That he has made us overwhelmingly victorious in Christ Jesus. He has made us the light of the world. In the midst of darkness, we have this light that we can take out into the world and bring hope and help and direction. And he has, in Christ, I am gifted by God to serve others. Okay? We went over those fast. And you will go over some of those again tonight. And we're praying God's Spirit will remind you. But Satan always attacks our identity in Christ. And there's some of you that maybe while we were going through this, you said, you know what? You've probably heard Satan say, yeah, you're, you're supposed to be a new creation in Christ, but you haven't changed much. You, yeah, you're supposed to be a child of God, but really, is, is what you did right there, is that evidence you're a child of God? If people really knew you, Satan says, if they really, really knew what goes on in your mind and in your heart, and they really knew, they would be shocked. You can say you're a child of God. You can say you're a new creation. You can say you're washed and sanctified and justified. If people really knew what's going on in your life they wouldn't say that where is the victory Satan says where's the victory in your life you know you're a loser I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands but those are, those are real things that come in our life that we say yeah all this sounds great, but the reality is, in the present, right here and now, I, I feel like I blew it this last week. I, I came here today, but there, there's no, whoo, victory in Jesus. It's like, whoo, we're getting annihilated. And we can, you know, we can dress up, come to church and act like, but deep inside it's like, yeah, Pastor, you went through those 13 things, but the reality is it, 
it's not right here in my life in the present. We, we say we're gifted by God to serve others, and Satan comes and says, you, you don't even care about others. In fact, you mock others, and you, you don't want to have anything to do with others. And yeah, I'm a new creation. God's gifted me to care about others. And, and Satan says, you selfish little imp. You, you just care about yourself, and you know what? We can't argue it. And you are gifted by God. And we say, <laughs> when it came to handing out gifts, God forgot about me. I don't have any gifts. I, I mean, I, there's nothing that stands out in my life. And, and these are the battles, these are the struggles that, that we battle with. And we all have a past, and many times that haunts us. We all have a present, and we all have a future. John Newton said something along this line, I am not what I used to be in the past. I am not what I want to be right now in the present. But praise God, I am not what I'm going to be by the grace of God. And it comes to identifying these three areas in our life and, and to know my identity is in Christ. The past, in Christ, I have been set free from all the guilt of my past. I have been set free from the penalty of my sin. I am washed. In the present, I'm no longer, as we said earlier, I'm no longer a slave to sin. I have been set free from the power of sin, and the Holy Spirit is at work in my life, making me more like Christ. And in the future, thank God, someday I will be liberated from the presence of sin. There will be no more sin, no more battle with the flesh. That's that's who I am in Christ Jesus. But then it, the question is, okay, how do I establish, how do I actually live in my identity? Back to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> Verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Establishing my identity in Christ and staying in my identity in Christ begins with, first of all, receiving Christ. As you have received Christ for the forgiveness of sin, to deal with my sin, past, present, and future, then I have the power of God at work in my life. So it begins, there must be the beginning point of where we say, God, I can't hide it. My, my sin, as we sang, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious part. All of my sin, not in, in a part, but all of it in the whole was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. The only thing that frees us from the guilt and the burden and the penalty of sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. So it must begin with receiving Christ. But there are many that are, have received Christ, but they're not walking in their identity. So he says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, 
rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. He says, you receive Christ, now build your faith. Put down the roots of your faith, being rooted in your faith and built up in your faith. Establish your faith. There's only one way that you put down roots. There's only one way you build up the faith, and it's in direct proportion to the Word of God. You must be a student of the Word of God. You must get the Word into your life. The more of the Word you get, the greater your faith will be. Faith comes by what? Hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You can't separate the two. So I can mentally know I'm a child of God. I, I've been gifted by God to be used of God. I'm a member of his family. I'm forgiven. I'm washed. I'm sanctified. But the reality of that won't be brought out in my present life unless I am building my faith and getting in the word and, and seeing the truths about God and and the promises of God, and understanding his character and nature. In Jude 20, he says, building up yourselves in your most holy faith. What did you do this week to build your faith? I mean, if our faith is neglected, it's going to diminish. What did you literally do? And in the span of the week, how much Time was, was put into that, building your faith. This is the only thing that's going to help us to walk in victory. We, we can't be overwhelmingly victorious because we're neglecting the word. It's the word that gives us the faith and rooted and built up in him. And I, I like and I don't like how it says, abounding in the faith with thanksgiving your faith is going to be manifested as you get in the word of God and it's going to be manifested through thanksgiving this this last week Marilyn and I said to each other well we need to give thanks for this I don't know why, I don't feel like it, but that's what we need to do. As a step of faith, as a step of obedience, that I am a child of God, and I believe God is at work in my life, and he has allowed this into my life for a purpose, and he is at work in me right now, so God, I thank you that you are able to take even this and make it work together for good to mold me and shape me to your image. It's not just to make it good for me, but to mold me and shape me to your image. I love you and I'm committed to your purpose. And it's, it's, by, it's by that step of obedience that we build our faith. See, we need, to learn, we need to learn to talk to ourselves rather than listen to ourselves. Because our mind says, there's no hope for you. Who would say that, God or Satan? Satan, right? Who would say, you're a loser? Satan. We need to test every thought. Who would say, I might as well give up, there's no hope? Who would say that? See, it's, it's those most basic things that in Christ, I want to build my faith right here in this present life. And okay, this thought that comes into my mind, is that a thought from God or from Satan? There's only two sources. And as we continually test every thought and bring it into subjection, and as we commit, okay, this is of God, so I'm going to go with that. No, this isn't of God. I, I, I need to put it down. But I don't feel like putting it down. You feel like getting revenge. You feel like what, whatever. 
But no, that is not going to build my faith. And it is being rooted and built up in him, abounding in thanksgiving and testing every thought. And then look at Colossians chapter 1. If you then were raised with Christ, if you are a child of God, if you are trusting in his resurrection, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind and affections on things above, not on things of this earth. So, I receive Christ, I build my faith, I set my mind on things of eternity. When I only think about this life, it is really depressing and defeating and discouraging. When I look around me, it's that way. When I look inside me, it's that way. But when I realize, whoa, I have a future that is indescribable. There's coming a day when there's no more battle with the flesh. There's coming a day when everything is made right, when there's justice. And, and by focusing on that, it gives me hope right here in the present. I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to keep battling. I'm going to keep yielding to God and not to the flesh because the best is yet to come. And I believe God, and, and I'm standing in the identity I have in Christ, and I know the best is yet to come. You set your mind on heaven. Then, notice verse 8 of chapter 3. Back here to the nitty-gritty, nasty now and now. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie one to another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew and so on. But Christ is all and in all. So he says... You need to put off continually in this present world, put off the old man. This is what the old man wants to do. No, get angry, talk bad, be selfish, be filled with pride. No, put those off. And then what do our verses say? Put on as the elect of God. Holy and beloved. What are we supposed to put on? Bowels of mercy. Kindness. Humbleness of mind. So you go do business with someone and they're kind of grouchy and complaining and, you know. No, I, I want to say I can take my business elsewhere and I'll never come back. But no, you're putting off the old man. And you put on the new man, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, kindness. It's, it's this continually, put off this. This is what I want to do, but this is what God wants me. Put off and put on. Put off and put on. Then we will be in the reality of, our, I'm a child of God. A child of God doesn't act that way. I'm a representative of God. Man, I can't be doing that. And it's put off and put on and rest in the promises of God. What did God say? Philippians 1.6 He that began a good work in you when he brought you the gospel and he worked in your heart and he saved you from all your sin he began a good work in you, and right here in the present, he promised that I will continue that work until you see him. So, man, it's really rough. What I'm going through a rough spell right now, and it's really tough. I don't even see God in it. But I know God promised 
he began this work. I can't see him. I can't feel him. I, I believe him. This is my identity. He said he'd begin a good work and he will do it. And I know the best is yet to come. And someday it will be worth it all. See, it's learning to see ourselves as God does. We, we stumble and fall. God doesn't come and kick us while we're down and say, you lousy bum, you'll never amount to anything. A just man falls seven times and rises up again, and God says, let's, let's get up and try this again. You know, when you were teaching your kids to ride a bike, you're running along behind them, let go, they fall over. You say, let's try it again. You go along, and they're watching your hand behind them more than they're, and you let go and they fall over. You didn't say, you clumsy little ox, you'll never learn to ride a bike, forget it. Do you think? God deals with us differently. But we're believing the devil's lies and, and we're staying down and walking in mediocre Christianity. It's not walking around, oh, I'm a child of God and I'm holy. No, but in our heart we say, I am a child of God and I am a representative of God and I'm going to live it and I'm going to show it and I'm believing that it's going to be worth it all when we see Jesus. And it will be. Are there days that it seems like it's not worth it? Absolutely. Are there sometimes more days than not? Absolutely. Is it a battle? Absolutely. But see yourself the way God does. And then to see others the way God sees others. God doesn't see them as fools and and no hope and to be avoided. He desires to bring them to him. And, and the reality is that in Christ, all we have is Christ and that is all we need. And we rejoice in that. We're going we're gonna to close our service today singing two songs and the first one is Blessed Assurance. And, and as I was thinking on this this week, we just sing this song. Blessed, you know. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. What we have right now in Christ is just a little sample of what it's been. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I am an heir of salvation. This isn't you're an heir, a rich uncle put you in his will and gave you his thousand acre farm in southern Iowa. If that was true, you'd say, whoa, when's the old guy going to die? No, you are an heir of God. What, what's the next phrase in it? Heir of salvation. It's right up here. Purchased of God. I have been born of his spirit. I'm washed in his blood. Blessed assurance. It's not up to me. It's in Christ. I know I'm going to heaven because of what Christ did. So let's stand together. Jason's going to come lead us. And I want you to think of the words and rejoice in your identity in Christ. <clears throat> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising
sing my Savior all the day long. We'll sing the third verse, but it's perfect submission. I'm yielding to God. I'm submitting to him. And when I do, all is at rest. I, in my Savior, am happy and blessed. I'm watching and waiting. See, it's looking for his, his glory, setting my affections on things above. But right now, I'm filled with his goodness, and I'm overcome with his love. God, that you love me? Why? Through you, I can love others. And that's our story as we sing verse 3. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior My story, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. And the best part of it all is he will hold me fast. He's the one holding me. And in the midst of the storms of life, he is the one that holds us. Our identity is in him as we sing, he will hold me fast, rejoice in that. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is all and cold he must hold me fast he will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so he will hold me fast those he saves are his delight will hold me fast precious in his holy sign he will hold me fast he'll not let my soul be lost his promises shall last bought by him at such a cost he will hold Justice has been satisfied, he will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life, he will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sign, when he comes at last, he fast he will hold me fast for my savior loves me so he will hold me fast amen those
Those he saves are his delight. He delights in you even if you don't delight in yourself. He loves you. And we need to walk in the truth of that. Lord, I pray if there are any here that have never called upon you for the forgiveness of sins, Lord, I pray today before they leave that they would. To be brought to a new identity, a real identity, an eternal identity. And then, Lord, I pray for every one of us as believers. Help us to recognize and have discernment by your spirit to the lies of Satan. Help us to stand in the new identity we have in you, to rest in the promises of you. Help us not to be weary in putting off and putting on, but, Lord, help us to look forward to the day that you soon return again and all things will be made right. Lord, until then, may we with joy and love be representatives of you that are accurate and true. We pray in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. He loves you. He's at work in you. And he's coming again. Maranatha.